Wilkinson, who is the Director of Blockchain Solutions at Finterra. He has extensive experience in blockchain, IT, and finance. His past projects include cross-border payment platforms, e-commerce gateways, an asset exchange, all being built around decentralized blockchain architecture. And he's going to be talking about smart chain architecture, a modular blockchain model. Can you please give Terry a very warm welcome to the stage? Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Terry Wilkinson. I'm the director of blockchain solutions at Finterra. So at Finterra, we're building our own blockchain protocol, uh, our own blockchain network. So today I want to kind of share with you a key piece of that protocol. Uh, bef but before I do that, I want to kind of take a survey. Um, how many people here are familiar with smart contracts or how smart contracts work? OK. Uh, how many people know about side chains? OK. And how many people are familiar with plasma architecture or state channel architecture? OK. Uh, so my talk is fairly technical, but I'll try to make it as painless as possible. Uh, today I'm going to talk about smart chain architecture, uh, a, a modular blockchain model. So what are smart chains? Smart chains are essentially smart contracts, smart contract enabled side chains. So if you don't know what a side chain is, Essentially, a side chain is, is, a, is a separate network, a separate blockchain that communicates with another chain to transfer value back and forth. And it does this via a very efficient light client for transaction validation. We also use Plasma-like smart contract interaction, interaction. So if you're not familiar with Plasma architecture, essentially Plasma uh, uses smart contracts to communicate between blockchains, uh, and it does so using state channels. Um, but we, we kind of uh, exclude state channels from this and just use the basic uh, kind of mechanism of, of using smart contracts to communicate between blockchains. So what can we do with this? We can uh, securely, cryptographically securely uh, transfer value between two chains. So this is in terms of tokens, network tokens, and other tokens. And we can, uh, more importantly, we can securely transfer uh, smart contract state. So this allows us to do interchain or cross-chain smart contracting. There are a few dependencies that this relies on. The first of these is that each chain must be able to interpret the smart contracting language of any other chain that it communicates with. Uh, the easiest example of this is if they share the same smart contracting language, but it's not necessary. In our case, uh, we match the Ethereum virtual machine uh, specification. And so uh, we use Solidity. Our, our contracts are written and compiled in Solidity. Each chain must be able to validate the transactions on the other chain. And so this is where the light client comes into play. Uh, this needs to happen very quickly. Otherwise, it's not very useful. And so we need our light clients to be very efficient. And the last dependency is that they have to share the same key pair account. They have to have the same account between two chains, which means that they need to use the same cryptographic algorithm to generate these accounts. But that's it. So these are the only three dependencies that we need. Uh, all other architectural choices are decoupled. And what I mean by that is, if I want to run a different consensus algorithm from a different chain, or if I want to choose a different peer-to-peer -peer networking layer or a different database, all of these architectural decisions can be done on different chains. So I'm going to give an example of how this is accomplished. Um, this is an example of a transfer of value, so transferring tokens from one chain to another. Before we do this, we need to actually deploy the same ecosystem of contracts on two different chains. After we've done that, we need to register these chains with each other. Uh, register is done via transaction in a normal manner. Uh, essentially, it allows uh, the origin chain and the destination chain to know that the other chain is in the ecosystem and safe to communicate with. And then we introduce a, a shared user account. And so the user first 
uh, initiates a withdrawal transaction on our origin chain. In this case, it's chain A, and it includes a bunch of these parameters, and these are, these are integral for, for keeping everything safe and secure so that we can cryptographically validate all of the information that's being passed. Uh, origin ID and uh, destination ID, these are basically hashes of the chain's genesis.json file. Uh, the contract address uh, that we're calling, the hash of the bytecode of the contract, and the value that's being passed. You'll notice up in the corner that currently um, the user account has 100 uh, tokens of value. So they send this withdrawal transaction, and then it's the job of the smart contract on chain A to validate these things, cryptographically validate these things. After they've been successfully validated, uh, we process the transaction on chain A, and we move value from the user account to the smart contract. So this is important to know. Uh, smart contracts don't have private keys. And so once you send tokens to a smart contract, unless you provide a way to withdraw those tokens, they're essentially locked in the smart contract. On the other end, on the other side, chain B, we do have a way to withdraw these tokens, actually, uh, or, or take this value out of a smart contract. We call it uh, a deposit uh, call. And so user, after the withdrawal transaction has been processed on chain A, they use the ID hash of that withdrawal transaction as proof to run a secondary transaction on chain B. And so chain B's job is to validate these. It, it uses its light client to make sure that this transaction was processed on chain A. And we know, because they share the same bytecode, that the, that the transaction on chain A also validated all of these uh, parameters already. Uh, but sometimes it has to do secondary checking just to make sure. Once everything passes, we process the transaction. And 100 uh, token value is issued or minted on contract on chain B. And after validation, we send this to the user on chain B. So here's a complete loop of moving uh, value transfer from chain A over to our destination chain, chain B. So what are the benefits of this kind of architecture? So we get to take advantage of all of the benefits of plasma architecture. So Plasma, if you're not familiar, uh, was a design pattern introduced by Vitalik Buterin and Joseph Poon uh, sometime around last year. Um, essentially, it has one kind of inherent flaw, or, or I would say security risk. So how Plasma architecture works is all transactions are accepted by default, unless someone argues, unless someone provides proof that that transaction is not correct. So this can introduce risk into the system. It means by default, I accept all transactions, even false ones. Right? I can accept false information into my blockchain if nobody argues with me in time. And so I think this is kind of a, a big design flaw and should, should be mitigated against. So we avoid that in this case, but we get all of the benefits. So this kind of architecture ends up being flexible and modular. I mentioned earlier, we can make any design choices between these two chains. Uh, if one chain is running proof of work, the other one can run proof of stake. If one of these chains is public, the other one can be private. Any kind of design choice to kind of fit whatever business requirement that you want. It ends up being scalable. Let's say we have a product chain on the left here, and it fills up with transactions. It can't keep up with the transaction load. Well, so in this case, we can uh, kind of horizontally, linearly scale out. Think of uh, something like cloud computing or Amazon. We can spin up new instances of chains, essentially doubling our capacity for transaction load or tripling, or kind of indefinitely as long as we have resources to spin up these new chains. It ends up being interoperable. Uh, the whole ecosystem is completely interoperable within itself. Interoperability means that two blockchains can securely, cryptographically securely, communicate with each other and pass trans, uh, transfer value uh, and uh, smart contract state 
uh, but beyond just within the ecosystem, we're actually using the tools that others are using to communicate between large public chains. So with this kind of architecture, we could uh, hook up to Cosmos, we could hook up to Polkadot, right? These are um, internets of blockchains. Or if those don't seem efficient or, or we can't use them properly, uh, we, can, we can fall back to Plasma architecture. Uh, the benefit here is that uh, at any point, we can checkpoint on any other chain. So this gives us the ability for disaster recovery. If I'm on a small chain that's not supported by a lot of validators, and someone attacks that chain, but I've checkpointed on a large public chain that's very secure, then I have a, I have a place where I know this was a valid state that I can roll back to. And last is security. So in addition to the checkpointing security feature, uh, this kind of architecture allows us to um, mitigate or maybe sandbox or compartmentalize applications. So if you think about something like the Ethereum network, if I deploy a contract on the Ethereum network, I deploy it in one place, but it's network-wide. So if something's wrong with that contract, it affects the whole network. But that's not the case in this kind of architecture. We can, we can, uh, we can box off certain parts of applications, and they don't have to affect uh, other, other, other uh, applications or, or things running in the ecosystem. And so um, I'd be happy to talk to you guys more in detail. Uh, any questions are welcome. I'm here with uh, uh, my compatriots, Amin and Eugene, and we have a booth out here. Uh, feel free to come, come ask me questions. I, I love to talk about blockchain all the time, so thanks. <laughs>